tap one of this, my foot hangs on the cord. Well, I lean forward thinking I'm off of it, so I make a confident step back the next one to land flat on my back, right in front of everybody. You hear the crowd, they're like, ooh. And you're like, okay, good. And now I've got to go lead the service. So maybe I, I feel your pain this morning in more ways than you probably know. But it's always that awkward moment when you're the one that's supposed to start everything and things are not quite exactly like you want them to be. You're kind of like, okay, what's going to happen now? It's like walking out on ice and not knowing if it's thin or thick. Am I going to make it out here or am I not? Do you know that 90% um, probably of people have an inferiority complex? 90% of people have some form of inferiority complex. So that means that they are consciously thinking that something is wrong with them or someone's looking at them or someone's thinking about them. The other 10% have a superiority complex. They're constantly looking down at the 90% of them. So none of us are okay. Well, if there was ever a story in the Bible about overcoming inferiority and living out what God's called you to do, it's Gideon. Man, and, and a lot of times it seems like we, this story is taken and it's taught to children, but as we get older, it's kind of passed over. And I'll be honest, see, up until a few years ago, I hadn't really done a lot of studying on Gideon. But people would ask me who he was, I wouldn't have known who, who he was. He was the, um, the uh, I believe, the seventh judge of Israel. I will confirm that eventually. But um, Gideon was one of the judges of Israel. So, what we're talking about today is Gideon, and we're saying from the wine press to the warrior. Alright, now Israel had a big problem. And that first problem was they had a big enemy. Israel had been held captive by the Midianites for seven years. And if you're, if you've got your Bible and you want to turn, just go to Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6. If you want to follow along today, I'm pretty much all in one place. I know a lot of times I'm all over the place. I use a lot of scripture just because I would rather you hear it from the Bible than hear it from me. You can't argue with the Bible, but you can argue with me. Uh, so, Judges chapter 6, they had a big problem. They had been captive for seven years. And I thought it was bad. The issues they had, they were in hiding. <coughs> they didn't want to go out in the public because literally it was that hard on them. And God had allowed this to happen because of their sin. Now, this is where we're at. Starting out. Judges chapter 6 verses 1 through 3. And it says, The Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. So the Lord handed them over to the Midianites for seven years. The Midianites were so cruel that the Israelites made hiding places for themselves in the mountains, caves, and strongholds. Pretty bad. Whenever the Israelites planted the crops, mortars from Midian, Amalek, and the people of the east would attack Israel, camping in the land and destroying crops as far away as Gaza. And they left the Israelites with nothing to eat, taking all the sheep, goats, cattle, and donkeys. I guess you're pretty, uh, pretty hungry if you don't. But, verse 5. These enemy hordes coming with their livestock and tents were as thick as locusts, and they arrived on droves of camels, too numerous to count, and they stayed until the land was stripped bare. So Israel was reduced to starvation by the Midianites. Then Israel cried out to the Lord for help. So it's not bad. I mean, when you're, when you're making a place for you in a mountain, it must be pretty bad. It must be pretty bad. Kind of like one of those situations when you've got into it with your wife, and you'll go outside and find a project to do. All of a sudden, you're weed eating, and you hate weed eating. Or all of a sudden you're washing your car, your car never gets washed. Just because you don't want to be too close to the source that is coming down on you. And that's what's happening with the Midianites. They're out there, and they're in the mountains, and they're hiding. And they have nothing to eat. See, we don't even know what it's like to be like that, to not have anything to eat. Totally does not have anything. There's places we can go, there's ways that we can get food. I mean, in America, you can beg and make a pretty good living. People do it. You're just getting the scraps of everybody else. And you're still living better than most of the world. And so there's places to go to get food. Now, the next thing that we realize, so Gideon has, he has a big enemy. He has a big problem. But the next thing is Gideon has a big commission or task. And I want to show you what that is. Judges chapter 6, verses 11 and 12. Then the angel of the Lord came and sat beneath the great tree of Ophrah, in which belonged to Joash of the land of Bethlehem. A beezer. There we go. We'll try that. <coughs> Gideon, son of Joaz, was threshing wheat at the bottom of a wine press to hide the grain from the Midianites. So he's hiding.
sliding down on this, and I got a picture to show you the minute of a wine press and what that looks like. It's like a big hole in the ground. And he's down in there hiding fresh and weak, trying to get enough to eat, but not wanting to be seen by the enemy. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him. And I love this line because the angel knew exactly what to say. And he said, mighty hero, the Lord is with you. Now what we see about Gideon is he doesn't really look like a mighty hero right now. He's hiding. He's down in a wine press, just trying to get some grain to eat. He's been held captive by the Midianites for seven years. And the angel of the Lord says, mighty hero, the Lord is with you. I like it already. Verse 13, Sir Gideon replied. Now it's interesting that the angel of the Lord shows up and, and Gideon just, it's just on Sir. Sir Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has this all happened to us? And where are all the miracles our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say the Lord brought us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites. Then the Lord turned to him and said, go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. Because I am sending you. Now it doesn't say that the angel said to him at this point. It says, then the Lord said to Gideon, go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. Because why? I am sending you. So now Gideon, all of a sudden, his day-to-day -day life, his day-to-day -day routine, the things that he are just normal for him to do. He tried to find a way to feed himself. He went out that morning thinking it's a normal day. I will hide from the Midianites. I will try to get by by whatever means is necessary. I will fresh wheat in this hole. This doesn't look like he's fixing to get this great commission, this great task from God. It looks like everyday life. And then all of a sudden, mighty hero is how he's introduced. So now he's got this great task and the Lord says, go out. And I'm sending you to free your people. Something that people couldn't do for the last seven years, Gideon is now going to be able to do. This is what a biblical era wine press looked like. So you kind of get an image of where Gideon was. He's down in this hole. He's probably crouched down, threshing this wheat, hoping to get something to eat. So Gideon is your big hero. He was greeted as mighty warrior. Gideon, Gideon, you know, he's this big hero, but he's hiding in a wine press. He's hiding. How many heroes do you know that go into hiding? Does it make sense? Why would he be hiding? And so we look at Judges 6, verse 15, it says, But Lord, Gideon replied, how can I rescue Israel? Now this is where Gideon starts showing his inferiority. He says, how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I am the least in my entire family. Not only am I from the smallest clan, I'm also the smallest of the clan. So, you know, everybody in my family is greater than I am. And we're the weakest of all the tribes. God has went down and in Gideon's eyes has scraped the bottom of the barrel. <laughs> Hmm, interesting. So, doesn't this sound familiar though? I want you to see something this morning. That God has a pattern of choosing the unlikely. It's something about when He chooses the unlikely that people have to recognize that it's Him. It's probably why I'm your pastor. It's because God likes to choose the unlikely. And He likes to take them and do greater things because we really don't know what we're doing. We just follow Him and it makes us look good. We have no idea. John, John and I talk about this all the time. We really don't know what we're doing. We just follow him. And, but God has a history of doing this. All right, think about the story of David. Israel wanted a king. So God gave him Saul. And after a while, that just didn't work out. Saul kind of did his own thing. He left God. Now Saul looked like the likely suspect. Saul was tall, dark, and handsome from what I understand. He was very strong. And so God gave them what we would think is a leader. Here's this great, strong man. But he didn't work out. You know why? Because his heart wasn't in the right place. So, Samuel, the priest, is sent out to find another king. And he's supposed to go anoint another king. And so, God basically says, hey, you cried enough about Saul. We've been upset enough about Saul. 
now it's time to do something different. I want you to go to the house of Jesse, and I want you to anoint the next king. And so this is what it says. It says that, so here we go. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 6 and 7. When they arrived, Samuel took one look at Eliab and thought, Surely, this is the Lord's anointing. Here's somebody, the tall, dark, and handsome. He'll lead us. But the Lord said to Samuel, Don't judge by the appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way that you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. See, Samuel would even go on through and go through seven more of Jesse's sons. He'd be like, no, David's not the one. No, Don's not the one. Eric's not the one. Charlie's not the one. And we're just going through. And we're like, man, well, who is it, God? And what, what is the point of me going through seven people? And what's interesting at this point, too, is we find out later that David is not even present for this meeting. <laughs> you want to talk about being counted out? How about you're not even invited to the meeting? Not only are you not the one they're going to choose, but you're not even considered. You're somewhere else doing something else, working for the other seven and your father that are back at the house. You're out there keeping their sheep. In other words, you're picking up their scraps. You're doing their chores. You're not even in, in consideration. And the reason we know this is because we look at verse 11. And of chapter 16, and it says, Then Samuel asked, Are these all the sons you have? Can you imagine? He's went through seven sons, and he's like, God's like, Nope, that's not him. Nope, that's not him. Nope, that's not him. Oh, slightly overweight one. Nope, not him either. You know, you're just going down the list, and you're like, Boom, 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 boom. And then Samuel just kind of throws up his hands in the air, and he's like, Well, who then? And he asked Jesse, he says, Well, who is it? Is there any more sons? Do you have anyone? He says, Oh, there's just one, but he's out here just keeping sheep. And Samuel tells him, He says, Well, go get him. He said, We won't even sit down and eat until it's here. Because, see, God doesn't choose the likely. If He chose the likely, the likely would depend on their own power. <clears throat> the likely would rise up with their own strength, they would do their own thing. And so I don't know why a lot of times we stand around scratching our head and go, God, I, I can't do that. I don't have the power. Exactly. Why don't we just let God do it through us? It would be so much easier. And let me tell you, the road's a lot straighter that way. Why don't you just recognize that you don't have the power, but that doesn't mean that you can't do it. It just means that you won't do it, but God will. So, Samuel says, sin for him. Go get him. And then, God selects the improbable to do the impossible to bring glory to his name. And that's what I like about doing things that I don't know how to do. Is he selects the improbable to do the impossible to bring glory to whose name? His name. Because what? It's all about him. It's not my story we're writing. I'm just a part of his story. This life's not about me. It's about him. It's about his glory. And the fact that I even get to play a small part of it is miraculous in itself. We always think that everything that's happening in life is circled around us, but the, the, the circle's a lot bigger, and we're just a small piece of it. Francis Chan, in his book, Crazy Love, he, he likened it like this. He said, have you ever seen a movie where somebody just walked through the back briefly, and then when they saw that, they said, hey, look at me, what about the star of the show? And said, no, you're just walking in the back, and we're even smaller than that. Our part in this whole thing is so small. Now, let's go back. Let's look back at Gideon. Here we go. Chapter 6, verse 15. But Lord, Gideon replied, How can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest of the whole tribe of Manasseh. And my family is the least. See, verse 16 is fixing to come up. And I want you to see it. But verse 16 will describe perfectly how God works so profoundly. And you will read by it if you do not look closely. I'm going to show you 16 in just a minute. And you'll read by it if you don't look closely. Gideon in verse 15 has just said, my clan is the weakest of the tribes. That was excuse number one. And then he says, my family is the least of those. That was his excuse number two. Think about the excuses that we make. He's already given you two excuses, but I'm going to show you the answer to those excuses. 6.16, then the Lord said, I will be with you, and you will destroy the Midianites, as if you were fighting against one man. Do you see the difference 
The difference is God is with him. I can't do it. They fought seven years and cannot overcome the Midianites. And now God tells Gideon, he says, you know what? I'm going to be with you, and it's going to be like you're fighting one man. You're not going to have any trouble. And we're going to see how this unfolds. Also, I want you to look at this verse right here. It just, just confirms what we're talking about here. Isaiah 41 14. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you, and I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. God is not concerned about your enemies. Because he'll take them down when he's ready. The things that you're stumbling on, the things that you think are too big for him to do, the family members who don't know Jesus, the lives that seem to be lost, all those things you got to quit trying to solve and you got to let him solve. There are things that are not within your capability to accomplish, but there are things that God can put in those paths that will resolve the issue. So quit holding on thinking you need the answers and just remember that God said, I will be with you and then you will destroy them like it's only one man. Man. See, you can have excuses. You can have your preconceived notions about yourself and about the abilities of others. But when the Lord says, I will be with you, your excuses and your doubts are blown away at that moment. They're no longer important. So he is either God at all or he's not God at all. And that's what you got to ask yourself. He's either God at all and that means, hey, it looks bad, it looks grim, but I trust him. Or he's not God at all. God at all. Because if you're not trusting him in the small things, and you're not trusting him in the big things, let me just say it, you're not trusting him. If every time something difficult comes in your life, it just weakens you to your knees, and you cry, and you pout about it, and you get mad, you know what? You're not letting God be God. You're trying to hold on to it. You're trying to do it. And the whole thing is, it's his to do when he gets ready to do it, and that's okay. The quicker we realize that, the easier it will be. Because when you realize that, nothing can stop him. Once Gideon took on the commission that was given to him, there was nothing that could stop him because God said it was going to happen. <coughs> so why don't you get in line with what the will of God is for your life and then just rise and act? It doesn't have to look certain. We don't live by sight, we live by faith. If everything looked possible, then there would be no need for God. I like it when it looks impossible. Right now, I'm going to build a new building. I've talked to Katie about it. We've talked to Randy about it and others. We have ideas of what we want to do. I don't know how we're going to do it. But when God gets ready, we're going to do it. And it's going to be good. And it's going to be right. And I'm not concerned about the finances. Because he's got a checkbook and he can write the check. Gideon begins purging the city of false gods. Because sometimes there's things that are in your way of accomplishing your mission. So Gideon, what he does is he goes to a town in the middle of the night, and they've got all these Asherah poles, as they were called, and they're, they're, they're just <coughs> idols to other gods, and he just cuts them down in the middle of the night. Let me just tell you, if you're worshiping those gods, you ain't happy about this. And we're going to see it in the scripture I share next. But he goes in the middle of the night, and he says, you know what, God told me to do it, so I'm going to go into town, and I'm just going to destroy all this stuff. Can you imagine going over to one of these Muslim nations and just saying, nope. I'm, going to dis I'm just going to tear down every idol in the middle of the night. Every one of your, your gods that you face, Muhammad, all these things, I'm just going to go through here and I'm going to take those down in the middle of the night. When the sun comes up the next day, they're going to be looking for who did that. And that's exactly what happens here. I want you to see this. Oh, let's go back. So I don't have that verse. I'll share it anyway. 6, 28 through 32, it says, Early in the next morning, the people of the town began to stir and someone discovered that the altar of Baal had been broken down and that the Asher pole beside it had been cut down. And in their place, a new altar had been built. And on it were the remains of the bull that had been sacrificed. So he's cutting them all down. And the people said to each other, Who did this? And after asking around and making careful search, they learned it was Gideon, the son of Joash. This is six, chapter 6, verses 28 through 32. I'm reading. Verse 30. Bring your son... The men of the town demanded of Joash, he must die for destroying the altar of Baal and for cutting down the Asherah pole. So they're headhunting them. 
But Joash shouted to the mob that confronted them, Why are you defending Baal? What are you doing here? You're defending Baal? Will you argue his case? Whoever pleads his case will be put to death by morning. If Baal truly is a god, let him defend himself and destroy the one who broke down his altar. From, from then on, Gideon was called Jerob Baal, which means let Baal defend himself because he broke down Baal's altar. It changed Gideon's name. Gideon's name was then on meant let Baal defend himself. Now let me show you something I've learned about. They went to, they went to Joash, who is Gideon's father, and they said, give us your son. Now imagine, Don, you got sons? Imagine a crowd of people, a whole crowd of town people show up at your door. And they beat down your door. And they said, throw out one of your sons, Don. Throw them out. My first thought is, there's a whole lot more of them than there are of me. What am I going to do? I guess I could shut the door. I could lock it and I could do like cops and run out the back door through the woods. <laughs> but Joash says, you know what? Y'all can go on. I'm not going to throw him out. And Bell can defend his own self. This is what I learned from that in studying that. I want you to look at this. What did I learn from Judges 6, 28, 32? Is that lying makes lies. Joash wasn't afraid of nobody. A whole town full of people show up to get his son. He tells them, you know what? Let Bell defend himself. They could have killed Joash right there. But Joash is a liar. And Gideon is a liar. I'll show you another thing. <laughs> a donkey makes a donkey. A lion makes a lion. Joash was lying. He created a lion. But a donkey makes a donkey. And every day, I get up and I look myself in the mirror and I have to ask myself this. What am I? And what am I going to create? Because whatever I am, most likely my son will be. And whatever you are, your children will be that as well. So when you're afraid, when you're doubting, when you're doing things that you know aren't right and bring dishonor to God and bring dishonor to your household, you know what? You show that you are the donkey. And when your children start to act like that later on in life, don't be surprised. Because we create what we are. Some will overcome that. If they didn't, there would be no hope. But it's not that easy. Because it's ingrained in our fathers. What will your children be? I can already answer that. <clears throat> Whatever flows through your blood will flow through theirs as well. And some, like I said, will overcome obstacles, but it will be obstacles that were passed down to them. So Joash produced exactly what he was. So it made me think. I, I read another passage. Now Gideon, we found him in the beginning. He's, he's hiding. He's stretching the weak. But if you think about that, where was everybody else at? It said they were in the mountains starving. Gideon was hiding from the enemy in the enemy's territory, making food to feed everybody else. So how cowardly was it really? We want to give him a hard time for hiding, but he was by himself somewhere making food for everybody else because he was a liar. You know what? When it's God's mission, it's God's battle. So Jared Bell, which means let Bell defend himself, that is Gideon. And his army got up early and went as far as the spring of Herod. And the armies of Midian were camped north of them in the valley near the hill of Morah. And the Lord said to Gideon, you have too many warriors with you. If I let all of you fight the Midianites, then the Israelites will boast to me that they saved themselves by their own strength. Therefore, tell the people, whoever is timid or afraid may leave this mountain and go home. So 22,000 of them left and went home, leaving only 10,000 who were willing to fight. But the Lord told Gideon, there are still too many. 
Bring them down to the spring, and I will test them to determine who will go with you and who will not. <coughs> and when Gideon took his warriors down to the water, the Lord told him, divide them into two groups. In one group, put all those who cut their hands with water and lap it up with their tongues like dogs. In the other group, put all those who kneel down and drink with their mouths to the stream. And only, and only 300 of the men drank from their hands. And all the others got down on their knees and drank with their mouths in the stream. And the Lord told Gideon, with these 300 men I will rescue you and give you victory over the Midianites. Send all the others home. So Gideon collected the provisions and ran for of the other warriors and sent them home. But he kept 300 men with him. Any great act of God in our lives is going to require big faith. But I want you to put yourself in Gideon's shoes for a minute. You got 32,000 men who have all lived there with you for the past seven years. And with those 32,000 men, before now, you've not been able to overcome the Midianites. They've still done whatever they wanted to do with you. So you had 32,000 men, and you couldn't get the job done. Now, you've got 300 men. God's kind of separated them out for you. And God says, take those 300 and you're going to defeat the Midianites with them. And so this is what happens. You've reduced yourself to the best of the best. But imagine that I'm going to take 20 men from here and I'm going to go fight ISIS. Seems crazy, doesn't it? I'm sure for me, it seemed crazy then too. What I do know is this, though. We give those 22,000 a hard time. There's 22,000 that left. See, it says, therefore, tell the people, whoever's timid or afraid may leave this mountain and go home. So 22,000 of them went home, leaving only 10,000 who were willing to fight. We lost 69% of our troops just by people who were afraid of can I tell you, when you're trying to do something, the ones who are afraid will get you killed. It's better for them to go into the house. The ones who are scared, the ones who aren't ready to put their feet on the water, the ones who are not ready to walk up to the door and see if it's open or not, let's just go ahead and get rid of them. Because you know what? I don't want to be fighting in the middle of the battle, think somebody's got my back, and then be scared and get my head chopped off. In the same way in the things that we do for Christ now, Sometimes we just need to get rid of the 69%. And I know that goes against what other churches are probably preaching you because they want to get everybody comfortable. But what I'm saying is it took Gideon getting all of his men uncomfortable in order to accomplish the task that God had for him. So I'm glad that the 22,000 went on to the house because what it allowed was the next ones to get the job done. And what we know of the final 10,000 is they weren't afraid but yet there were still too many. If we're going to depend on our own strength, then it makes sense to take the 10,000. But if we're not, if we're going to do it God's way, then it, takes, it makes sense to take the 300. Jesus took 12 with him. Why didn't he take 100? Why didn't he take 300? Why didn't he take 1,000? And those 12, minus Judas, Add one more that replaced him. Went and changed the world. See, you got to get down to the people who's ready to do it God's way. And anybody that ever plans for the Lord to be accomplished without the help of a mighty God, I have two questions for you this morning. Why aren't they already accomplished? If you don't need God's help, then why haven't you already accomplished the plans that He has for you? I should see people accomplishing great things all the time. If you've got all the strength, you've got all the resources, those are just things that we should be doing. It's just like if John asked me for $10, I should be able to give John $10, and I have to pray about it, and I have to take out the love offer, and I have to go out and do a car wash. I should give John the $10, right? Because I can meet all of his needs. Now, if God said, Matt, give John a million dollars, we're going to have to do some fundraising. Okay? All right? John, if he does, I pray I have the faith to get you there, brother. Uh, <laughs> But if I can accomplish it already, then why isn't it accomplished? The next thing I want to ask is, why don't you 
to ask God for bigger plans. If you can already accomplish it, then why don't you say, God, give me something that I can't do. Because then I can lean on you to get it done. See, my best moments with God are the moments when I have to admit, God, I have no idea how to do this. Boy, I've been there several times. Where I'm like, I don't know what we're going to do. And I don't know how to do it. See, but God gives Gideon what he needs. And this is what I want to show you. Is when Gideon needed encouragement, God gave to him. Gideon had a question that he was supposed to go with 300 men. He never once said, God, that's not enough men. Evidently, he trusted God enough to say, okay, let's go with these 300 men and we'll attack our enemy. But look here. God gives Gideon encouragement when he needs it. Judges chapter 7, 9 through 11. That night, the Lord said, get up. Go into the meeting and not camp. For I have given you victory over here. But if you're afraid to attack, go down to the camp with your servant Kura and listen to what the Midianites are saying and you will be greatly encouraged. Then you will be eager to attack. So Gideon took Kura and went down to the edge of the enemy camp. Now what I want you to understand is if you want to accomplish something, if you want to see this church accomplish something, take on one characteristic and one characteristic only and that's encouragement. You will get more from people out of encouragement you don't like the way that John's doing something? Why don't you encourage the things that he is doing? you don't like the way that I'm doing something? Why don't you encourage the things I, I am doing right? Because what happens is when I get encouragement, I push to do better. But when I get discouragement, I clam up and I get frustrated. Encouragement will take you further. And that's what God needs. He used encouragement. Now look, he says, go down to the enemy camp. I want you to listen to what they're saying about you, Gideon. That means that God's already put his words into the mouths of Gideon's enemies. Verse 12, the armies of the Midian, Amalek, and the people of the east had settled in the valley like a swarm of locusts. There is a bunch of them. Their camels were like grains of sand on the seashore. Too many to count. Now, I'm standing at the top of this hill, and I'm going, i got 300 men against all of these, and there's more camels than there are of us. And Gideon crept up. Incredible courage. Gideon crept up just as a man was telling his companion about a dream. And the man said, I had this dream. And in my dream, a loaf of barley bread came tumbling down in the Midianite camp. And it hit a tent, turned it over, and knocked it flat. And his companion answered this, your dream can mean only one thing. God has given Gideon, son of Joash, the Israelite, victory over me and all its allies. That guy may be the best dream interpreter I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> if, I told you, if I told you, John, that I dreamed last night that bread was going to roll down the hill and squash our tent, I don't know that you would tell me this. It's crazy. He said, it could only mean one thing. I don't even know how he was so confident. It's like, well, that only means one thing. Yeah, you ate pizza before you went to sleep last night. Uh, he says, no, it only means one thing. Your dream can only mean one thing. That Gideon, son of Joash, the Israelite, victory over, is going to get victory over Gideon in of us. And when Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, he bowed in worship before the Lord. Then he returned to the Israelite camp and shouted, Get up, for the Lord has given victory over the Midianite horse. You know what? At that point, I have to be with Gideon on this. If all these things had come to pass, you know what? It is time to go to war. It is time to go to battle. And let's go get it done. And I can't imagine uh, the excitement and the courage that all of a sudden had risen up in Gideon as he picked one person out of the swarm of locusts that were staying in the field. And he, lives, he walks up on one person and he hears this word from God. God put his word in the mouth of Gideon's enemy. God put his word in the mouths of Gideon's enemies. God will use whoever he wants to. Yeah. You remember the story of Balaam? God used the donkey and it spoke. It's pretty crazy. He can do that. He can use you. He can use me. And he can use our enemies to accomplish whatever he's done. Now, the next thing that happens is the battle begins. <coughs> Judges chapter 6. 7 verse 16. He divided 300 men into three groups and gave each man a ram's horn and a clay jar with a torch in it. He didn't say he gave him a rifle. He didn't say that he gave him grenades. He didn't say that they're going to have a flyover and bomb people and thing. It says no. He gave each man a ram's horn and a clay jar with a torch in it. And then he said to them, keep your eyes on me. And when I come to the edge of camp, do just as I do. And as soon as I and those with me blow the ram's horn, blow your horns too, all around the entire camp, and shout, for the Lord.
and for Gideon. And it was just after midnight, after the changing of the guard, when Gideon and a hundred men with him reached the edge of the Midianite camp, and suddenly they blew the ram's horn and they broke their clay jars. Now imagine you're standing out in the middle of the darkness, and then all of a sudden you start hearing these ram's horn, and all of a sudden there's these fiery torches everywhere. Because that's what happened. It was just a, it was a ploy to, to bring confusion. And it says, then all three groups blew their horns and broke their jars, and they held the blazing torches in their left hands and the horns in their right hand. It doesn't say anything about a sword. And they all shouted, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. And each man stood in his position around the camp and watched as all the Midianites rushed around in panic, shouting as they ran to escape. And when the three inch, the hundred Israelites blew their ranks on, the Lord calls the warriors in the camp to fight against each other with their swords. And those who were not killed fled the places as far as I don't, I don't know that word, I'm sorry. And Sarah, <laughs> and the border, and made it blow it. If, ever, if I say it, it's going to sound bad, and I don't know that. <laughs> I will ruin it. I promise. We'll have to bleep it out of Stephanie. <laughs> Get the picture, guys. We're going down into this pit, this valley, from our mountain, to fight a swarm of people. We have a ram swarm. We have a clay jar and we have a torch. I'm sure we got a sword on our belt somewhere just in case any slip by. But the majority of what we have is not things that normally do battle. Again, just showing the power of God that can take whatever gift you have and use it to battle for Him. It doesn't have to look like John's sword. It doesn't have to look like Jamie's sword. It can look like a clay jar, a torch, and a ram's horn. May not look like a preacher. May not look like a teacher. May not look like a missionary. I know that's the things that we're programmed into thinking that that's the only people God calls. But it may look like a mechanic. It may look like a computer program. It may look like the unemployed guy standing in line down there. But what happens is they break the jar. The torches are there. They blow the horns. And people are in such hysterics. Can you imagine? They start killing one another. Can you imagine not even knowing who your enemy is and you're just killing everybody? Stay up, cut up. They, they ain't killing any of the Israelites. That's pretty interesting. You got 300 men in the midst of thousands. These thousands are killing one another and they're not killing the Israelites. They're fine. God has a crazy way of doing things. They stood around and they panicked. It says afterwards that they killed a bunch were dead and many fled. And so Gideon, he starts going through town to town and he's searching out for the rest of it. Because when he's going to do something, he's going to do it right. And so what he does is he goes on this voyage after these two kings and, uh, and he chases them through these villages and he's going to get the, the Midianite kings and he's going to bring them back and he's going to kill them. And that's his plan. And this is what I want you to understand the next thing here. That God changed Gideon so much that even... His enemies notice. So this is where we're at. Zeba and Zalmunna, which are Midianite kings, the two Midianite kings fled, but Gideon chased them down and captured all their warriors. And after this, Gideon returned from the battle by way of Harris Pass. And there he captured a young man from Succoth and demanded that he write down the names of all the 70 officials and elders in the town. And Gideon then returned to Sokoth and said to the, to the leaders, Here are Zeba and Zalmunna. And when we were here before, and what happened, and I want to give you a little backstory on this verse here, verse 15, is when Gideon was going through from town to town, he said, Hey, give my men some food. Give them some water. And there were people that said, Oh, will you come back and do that for you? Not really thinking Gideon would be back. And Gideon told him, he said, when I come back, I'm going to take thorns from these bushes and I'm going to whip all your men for the way you treated me. And then he went into another town and they, they were giving him a hard time. And he said, well, that's fine, but when I come back, I'm going to kill these men and I'm going to tear down this tower that's in your city. So I'm just letting you know that when I do come back, you're going to be mad about it and you're going to get yours. And that's basically what he's telling them right here. He says, he says, Cat, he says, when we were here before, you taunted me, saying, Cat, sit in the first and then we will feed your exhausted army. Then Gideon took the elders of the town and taught them a lesson, punishing them with thorns and briars from the wilderness. 
And he also tore down the tower of the hill and killed all the men in that town. Because they got in the way of what God was trying to do. But look at this here. Gideon. He's hiding in a wine place. Fresh and weak. And the angel of the Lord says, Gideon is mighty warrior or mighty hero. He prophesies over Gideon for who he is. And now, this word is in the mouth of Gideon's enemies. Then Gideon asked Ziba, is out in the The men, he said, the men you killed at table, what were they like? And this is what they said, catch these guys. Like you, they replied, they all had the look of a king's son. I'm the smallest tribe. I'm the smallest family. I'm the smallest of my family. But God says, you're the son of a king. I'll put these words in your enemy's mouth. I'll put these words in your enemy's mouth. You and I, we have no excuse. <laughs> we have no excuse for not accomplishing anything because when God comes on us, all of a sudden, we are the son of a king. His enemies, look at him. They did not know him. They did not know who he was other than he had came after him. And he said, what did the people of Tabor look like? And he said, they look like you. They look like the son of a king. See, Gideon's whole physical appearance had changed at that moment. He was no longer hiding in a wide press. He was a warrior. And not only was he a warrior, he was a warrior king. Because kings, the God kings. What are you going to be this morning? Where are you going to be? Is Randy in here? Worship team. <coughs> Randy, would you come on this morning? Worship team. I want to challenge you this morning. Start living up to what God has for you. Because the plans that God has for you are bigger than the plans that you have for yourself. Remember, guys, lions create lions. Donkeys create donkeys. Kings create kings. What will you pass down? Joash would take on a whole city of people that wanted to kill his son. And Gideon would conquer a whole enemy because God told him to. Stand with me this morning. Wouldn't you love for the reputation that you have to be the son of a king in the eyes of your enemies? God wants to take you from the wine press to the throne. And He's going to do it victory after victory after victory. And He's going to give you victory by going with you. Because wherever He is, is where victory lies already. Challenge yourself this morning. Men, women, challenge yourself this morning. What will your enemies say about you? The ones that don't agree with your walk in Christ, what will they say about you? I want them to say, He looks like the Son of the King.
realize today more than anything is that I want to encourage you to live up to what God has for you. Because we need you to be the warrior that God created you to be. But if you keep looking at man's mirror, and you keep judging things by man's ways, and you keep looking at the way that people look at things, you'll always live down. But if you look up to what God has said, he says, my plans are to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. You know, things that we talk about in church, such as bringing Christ back to America, are possible. But not without warriors. Not without people ready to go to battle. Live up to what God's called you to do. <coughs> Let me pray for you. God, we love you. Thank you for this word. Lord, thank you for the story of Gideon. I didn't even know at the beginning of this week, God, what you wanted me to say about this. God, I just felt it so strong in my heart that this was the way to go. And, and, I, and I see it now, God. But Lord, we can live up to what you have for us. And with you, we can accomplish anything. So, Lord, let us get bolder. Let us get braver. Let us take the 300 against the storm and accomplish much. It may be small in number, but with you all things are possible, God. We lean on you. In your name I pray. Amen. 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 Uh, one thing that they want you to know today, I hope you'll stay around for the Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, when you go through the line, go through the line. If you have children, go through the line with your children. Okay? Don't just let them free flow and, and go which way they, they want you to go through the line and help them get through. Um, but just do that. Uh, what else? Yes. No Wednesday night service. No service this week. Spend it with your family. I know several have plans, several out of town already. So no Wednesday night service this week. Uh, anything else, Randy? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Kevin, why don't you come up here and just bless the food for you? Let's pray. But Jesus, we just thank you so much for this time, Lord. All the food and everybody who prepared it, Lord, we just ask you to bless them, Lord, and bless this food. And I pray, Lord, that if someone's here today and they say, well, I really didn't bring nothing, it doesn't matter. They brought themselves, Lord. So I pray they stay and we just enjoy the fellowship and the time together, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.